period. I really expected that, of course, there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable, uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know, and I had no, no choice in my mind except to, to resign. Based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing, I have not found that law. I've asked uh, Congress, we've asked a lot of people in the IRS, the IRS commissioners, helpers, they can't answer because if they answer, the American people are going to know that this whole thing is a fraud. I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. The income tax is nothing less than the enslavement of the entire country. Now, the control of the economy and the perpetual robbery of wealth is only one side of the Rubik's Cube the bankers hold in their hands. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced were World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, the U.S. administration was looking for any excuse it could find to enter it. In a noted observation by Secretary of State William Jennings, the large banking interests were deeply interested in the World War because of the wide opportunities for large profits. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man with intimate connections with the international bankers who wanted in the war. In a documented conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding how to get America into the war, Grey inquired, What will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States, and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So, on May 7, 1915, on essentially the suggestion of Sir Edward Grey, a ship called the Lusitania was deliberately sent into German-controlled waters, where German military vessels were known to be. And, as expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored ammunition, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the deliberate nature of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. The First World War caused 323,000 American deaths. J.D. Rockefeller made $200 million off of it. Not to mention the war cost about $30 billion for America, most of which was borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest, furthering the profits of the international bankers. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering our entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is clear that not only was the attack on Pearl Harbor known weeks in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. Roosevelt, whose family had been New York bankers since the 18th century, whose uncle Frederick was on the original Federal Reserve Board, was very sympathetic to the interests of the international bankers, and the interest was to enter the war, as as we've seen, nothing is more profitable for international bankers than war. In a journal entry by Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, dated November 25th, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was, how should we maneuver them into firing the first shot? It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. 
In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all the Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war, which by the way is completely in violation of international war rules. And on December 4th, three days before the attack, Australian intelligence told Roosevelt about a Japanese task force moving towards Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt ignored it. So, as hoped and allowed, on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered for the war. It is important to note, Nazi Germany's war effort was largely supported by two organizations, one of which was called IG Farben. IG Farben produced 84% of Germany's explosives, and even the Zyklon B used in the concentration camps to kill millions. One of the unspoken partners of IG Farben was J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in America. In fact, the German Air Force could not operate without a special additive patented by Rockefeller's Standard Oil. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American business funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did it finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, our current president's grandfather, and of course our former president's father. Keep that in mind when considering the moral and political dispositions of the Bush family. Vietnam The United States official declaration of war in North Vietnam in 1964 came after an alleged incident involving two U.S. destroyers being attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. This was known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This single situation was the catalytic pretext for massive troop deployment and full-fledged warfare. One problem, however, the attack on the U.S. destroyers by Vietnamese PT boats never happened. It was a completely staged event to have an excuse to enter the war. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara stated years later that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a mistake, while many other insiders and officers have come forward, relaying that it was a contrived farce, a complete lie. Once in the war, it was business as usual. In October 1966, President Lyndon Johnson lifted trading restrictions on the Soviet bloc, knowing full well that the Soviets were providing upwards of 80% of North Vietnam's war supplies. Consequently, Rockefeller interests financed factories in the Soviet Union, which the Soviets used to manufacture military equipment and send it to North Vietnam. However, the funding of both sides of this conflict was only one side of the coin. In 1985, Vietnam's rules of engagement were declassified. This detailed what American troops were and were not allowed to do in the war. It included absurdities like North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missile systems could not be bombed until they were known to be fully operational. No enemy could be pursued once they crossed the border of Laos or Cambodia. And most revealing of all, the most critical strategic targets were not allowed to be attacked unless initiated by high military officials. Apart from these imposed ludicrous limitations, North Vietnam was informed of these restrictions and therefore could base entire strategies around the limitations of the American forces. This is why the war went on so long. And the bottom line is this, the Vietnam War was never meant to be won, just sustained. This war for profit resulted in 58,000 American deaths and 3 million dead Vietnamese. So, where are we now? September 11th was the jumpstart for what is now an accelerated agenda by the ruthless elite. It was a staged war pretext no different than the sinking of the Lusitania, the provoking of Pearl Harbor, and the Gulf of Tonkin lie. In fact, if 9-11 wasn't a planned war pretext, it would be an exception to the rule. It has been used to launch two unprovoked illegal wars, one against Iraq and one against Afghanistan. However, 9-11 was a pretext for another war as well, the war against you. 
the Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the Military Tribunals Act, and other legislations are all completely and entirely designed to destroy your civil liberties and limit your ability to fight back against what is coming. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most brainwashed Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home, you can in turn be arrested with no charges revealed to you, detained indefinitely with no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured, all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. 